Hello and welcome. Today, today, we are talking, today we are talking about how to do a systematic review and meta-analysis. The initial goal is that you can pick and choose any, uh, any uh, topic which you like to do a meta-analysis. Uh, the concept is, I'm giving an example today, is like we looked at the mortality and severity of COVID-19 and ACE, and ACE, ACE inhibitors and ARBs, and we did a systematic review, meta-analysis and meta-regression. Concept is you look up for your search term by looking at articles you are interested in. You establish a search study saying we'll be using three major databases. In this case, we end up using WHO COVID-19 global database, CDC database, and literature COVID as well. If you're doing non-COVID related research, you can always pick up any three databases. One is your PubMed, which is your two go database, uh, your Embase or Scopus or Web of Science. I would suggest not to go beyond four databases because their their repeat articles start coming in. If you're doing a topic which is uh, in nursing field, then Synhal is a, a very good database to make sure that you can sacrifice a regular database to use Synhal for uh, for that part of it. Uh, each uh, systematic review meta analysis has to go through uh, your basic strategy that you create a search term, you run through those analysis. If you have access to your librarian, they should be able to do the search for you as well, and you should be able to get certain number. This is too high. Uh, we know that we have uh, maybe thousand times more articles than any other disease before COVID-19. Uh, so your search should be a couple hundred articles as you go into the initial part. Then you should be able to remove it. There, there's certain software, free software called Ryan or other softwares, you can use it. They kind of identify these repeat articles and kick them out for that matter. Then you might have a few hundred articles to search for. Most I've seen in my uh, literature reviews, non-COVID one, they're roughly 900,000, 1,200 some articles. You put up a team of three to five people, distribute these uh, couple hundred articles to each, and then you start excluding them based on the inclusion exclusion criteria you set. How you set the inclusion exclusion criteria is simple as you would do for a study that you set up if the study is not a case control or a clinical trial. The study doesn't include any of your uh, exposure like ACE, ARB in our sense, or they don't include your COVID-19 uh, uh, diagnosis or COVID-19 outcomes, you have to exclude them because you cannot use that data. Then you go into a final full article search and then you do a second review where you exclude them. First time you are being sensitive. Second time you are being specific, where you exclude articles that doesn't have full text. You can set your strategy up front that I want to have last 20 years, last 10 years, last five years articles, English only, full text and all those things. So you only get that kind of articles in your search strategy. But some articles will still filter through in your search strategy. You do a second review of remaining articles and kind of exclude others which are only case reports or just abstracts based on the articles you're doing it. One of the studies I'm working on right now, we're only looking for case reports because there's no clinical trials on that particular topic, but that's our different inclusion criteria. Once you get to your final text search strategy, then you do your quantitative analysis and then qualitative. Quantitative means you start extracting the number of patient treated, number of patient died, number of patient in control group, number of in cases group, and so on and so forth. Qualitative studies, we will cover them in second session, how you do qualitative assessment as a part of your studies too. So what we have talked so far is that you come up with your search, your title, what you are doing it, what topics you want to conduct it. Second is you establish your search strategy by looking at the literature, run through major databases, and then do a screening for sensitive screening, second specific screen to include your final articles. And then you should be left with somewhere from eight or seven or eight articles to 30, 35 articles in the usual case scenario. If you're getting a couple hundred articles and your topic is very rare, that means you have done something wrong, it means you're being very sensitive, you're including articles which doesn't have data and so on and so forth, or you only have three or four articles, that means you might have missed out on our strategy. So we can always discuss those things as we go along. Always look for, if somebody has already published an article six, seven, eight years ago, um, systematic review meta-analysis, instead of repeating everything else, you can pick up your date after their date of article search, and then you'll be able to update that particular topic. Second point to remember, before you do your search strategy at this stage, in this point, these search strategies should be registered. So every systematic review or meta-analysis need to be registered on Prospero because most journal, 90% of journals, they ask you what's your Prospero registration ID. Those who are in clinical trial world, you know that you have to register your clinical trial on nationalclinicaltrial.com. This is similar concept. This idea is that all ongoing or uh, projects 
in systematic review meta analysis they are registered on prospero so then people know what is being done as well in this regard one uh, point is that don't prematurely submit up front because people with more resources than you they end up taking the idea and they can they can do that meta analysis uh, before you started so i would say do all the work ready keep your team ready and then a day before you submit to prospero still you have to wait for them to approve it sometimes it takes four days sometimes it takes seven days no more than two weeks you can start your systematic review and go back and update your results uh, update your results for the day of the prospero of submission is done and then this is a prisma flow diagram which is needed without this diagram you should not be publishing your systematic review meta analysis uh, this talks about the identification screening legibility and included part of it this is part of a checklist if you have familiar with equator network where we have talked about the clear checklist a uh, care checklist for uh, apps or submission there you will get tons of different checklists for case control studies clinical trials and so on and so forth clinical trial you use consort uh, checklist for uh, systematic review meta analysis you use prisma checklist and this is part of a prisma flow diagram once you have done this part uh, this way this is one of your tables look like that the collect data you're collecting from each table is what's your first author the type of article type of study outcome data which country and then what was different mean age and some of those things you may not be using any of these uh, information in analysis this is a descriptive purpose it go into your table 1 or sometime you put this table as an appendix one that's your uh, uh, stats part of it uh, your main bulk come out of it uh, when you start doing it is your uh, is your forest plot in this forest plot what you do is you are actually putting together the odds ratio of your mortality or outcomes with each patient and what was the median odds ratio and confidence interval and so on and so forth and then gives you uh, the final odds ratio and all uh, this forest plot could be really busy this was a very very busy topic so my apologies for this uh, uh, lengthy uh, figure but your figure would look like more and less of this there are free software could be done or there will be people who have done this part you can actually utilize them uh, to remember if you collect patients raw numbers of total number of patients in this particular case group total number of patient in control group how many people died or how many people whatever your outcome was these things can be calculated as a mean standard deviation median iqr there are formulas you can if they have only given median value you can calculate mean from it if they have only given ranges you can calculate other things as well so there are different things going to this process as well a planning and until getting this point it take a lot of time reviewing the articles may take another month or so and then analysis doesn't take long enough so most time is spent in systematic review meta analysis planning inclusion exclusion searching the articles submitting it to prospero and actually doing the data collection is extraction from those part of it third point i want to talk about is heterogeneity this i2 square number and so on and so forth these things are done when you do the qualitative assessment or when you run the systematic analysis uh, with the forest plot part of it you want to have less heterogeneity i2 90% is a very high heterogeneity you don't control it but sometime you do a sensitive analysis you exclude some articles which are driving the whole force the heterogeneity might be driven by just one article which has maximum number of patient in that population and so on and so forth so there are multiple things in analysis uh, we'll be able to go and, and as we go look into it the one thing i'll not be covering today probably in next one some of the some of the qualitative analysis you would see the newcastle auto i scale and so on and so forth we'll we'll come back and then talk about it what does it mean at the time the result and discussion is something very similar you write down the main studies main results coming out from your study interpret them what is your summary of all these odds ratio what does it mean what if you do subset analysis of just cohort studies data as a subset analysis just clinical trial data as subset analysis what does it mean how changes are how the results are being changed talk about heterogeneity and how people should read your results in, in the light of those heterogeneity and so on and so forth discussion uh, part is and we did end up doing not only systematic review meta analysis and meta regression here so just avoid some of this figure which we are showing you uh, which is not maybe not applicable to uh, to to your simple meta analysis you'll be doing it risk of bias assessment and some of those things as i talked about in separate lecture we'll talk about it uh, you talk about your study characteristics you know total number of studies what was the primary outcome total number of patients in these studies uh, what was the mortality rate so on and so forth uh, and then you talk about you know what was your results of mortality outcome severity outcome based on what your primary secondary research questions are 
multi-regression model, meta-regression model, and so on and so forth. The publication bias and a quality of this part, they goes again. Uh, you can do multiple part. I think there's a funnel plot you have to create it uh, for that part of it. Uh, and then the so result section is pretty low because your main results go into your table, your figure, and your forest plot. Discussion comes very important. And same principle applies in discussion. As you remember from our previous lectures, we talked about summary of your main results. First paragraph. Second, third, fourth paragraph, you discussing your main results, those three or four points coming out of it against the published literature. This is your time to actually discuss the paper, which did not make it to your list of papers because they didn't meet the inclusion exclusion criteria, but you can utilize those papers which you end up excluding because either outcome was missing or something else and see where they fit in your story to defend your results in favor and against for it. You should always have a, uh, uh, the strength uh, paragraph, what was the main strength of this thing, and then definitely have a, a limitation section that what were the different limitations were, and then write about, and we talked about some of the limitations here, that limitation number one, three, four, five, and then talk about to overcome this, what did you do to overcome? We said this was a limitation, the substantial clinical variability was, to overcome that, we did a meta regression analysis and so on and so forth. You are not expected to be an expert in any of all those things. Reach out, we can connect you, or uh, once you have expertise uh, to talk about meta regressions, very easy. Data is already collected, you're just running those software and then get the data around it. Your conclusion should be simple. It should be what you have list, what you have actually found out. And usually in conclusion, we don't write any uh, any references. This is, uh, you see a couple of references are listed there. I would stay away from putting any references. Abstract and conclusion does not have any references. You're just concluding what it is. Apps I should not have any conclusion. And there are other things you know, who contributed and data availability and acknowledgement section. And we end up sending it to MedRx because it was taking a long enough time. We even before we submit it, we put in the preprint server as well, which got cited multiple times in that regard. And then uh, again is, you know, many of you see that in our uh, Bunsell and many us, we end up citing quite a few of our work, prior work done as well. Uh, it's well, so that's a good opportunity. Self citations are a little bit look, not looked up uh, for that matter, but uh, if you are in need and they fit your story, you should be able to cite some of your previous work in the same field as well. So today we just covered very briefly uh, initial basic steps, how to start a systemic review meta-analysis, data collection, how to write it up. We'll go into a little bit more details of how to write it, what, what are the nitty gritty details of writing it, as well as we'll talk about what would be the, uh, what would be the quality assessment of these papers, which new tools have come up and then you are expected to run those tools. So thank you so much for being here and please like, subscribe our channel, write in comment section and we'll bring it back to you uh, in the next uh, lecture on this.